Any questions you have? All right. Uh, Claire is here. Uh, Austin. Uh, now, Austin, you were not. No, you were here. You're waiting. She had it Christmas Eve. She went ahead and had it. Austin, what was the experience like? It was fun. Fun? No, fine. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I, fun. All right, fine. Jackson, are you communing? Yes. How'd it go? Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's like these commercials now. Okay, well, <laughs> why isn't it great? <laughs> uh, no, uh, any comments, questions? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. You understand what you're receiving there? Yes. Uh, Brea, I tried calling Brea, but Brea's not here today either, is she? Hmm, we'll keep trying her. Savannah, you're waiting? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Alex, I noticed you commuted last night. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I believe there's a frog in my throat. Uh, questions, comments, how, what'd you think? Fine. He told us. It kind of tastes whatever, but it's different. Yeah, bread's a little different. Okay, good. All right, Chloe, did you commune? Yeah. Okay, your impressions? Okay. Okay. <laughs> you going to keep communing? Yeah. Good, you should. Emmy, there's another one I wanted. She's not here today, is she? Mm -hmm. Got to get a hold of Emmy. Abby, you waiting? No. That's right, you did. You were kind of on the fence. Impressions? Oh, it was fine. <laughs> Seems to be the standard answer now. Fine. You accepted it the first time, now everybody's going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Hayden, how about you? You uh, communing? Uh, yeah. I yet. You have not yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so. You wouldn't have an impression yet, would you? Yeah. All right, folks, this is a new year and actually a new unit. And if, uh, well, no, take, before I get into that, I got just a few more things here. All right, Porter's not here, Porter's not here, Porter's not here. Porter, Hayden, you are here. I got some things. Now, did you get your portfolio back? So you were missing some things, and um, you're right. And I have them all graded. However, Mrs. Leahy, who helps check these books for me, probably has you down as um, not having some stuff. That's because I have it here. Okay. Let me just check here real quick, guys. Bear with me. It's nice what these phones can do, but they're not super, super quick. Michelle. There she is. Okay. Yeah. I need portfolios from Brea and Emmy. They're not here. Okay. Porter's missing sermon report number six. I may have that. Austin is missing Sermon Report 2 and Mentor Report 2. Does that make sense to you, Austin? Yeah. Okay. My darn mentor of hers. Who is your mentor? <laughs> My girl. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you. <laughs> Chloe is missing Sermon Report 3 and her Mentor Reports. Reports, two of them. Two of them? Yeah, there are two that are due this semester, first semester. I have one. So on. Okay. Um, if you folks can fill that in, what you're missing, we would appreciate that. Abby is missing her worship unit report. That's right here. Is that it was notes? right there. Why don't you pass that down to me? Surprisingly, Hayden, she doesn't see you're missing anything. And yet I have a lot of your stuff. Why don't you put this all into your portfolio now? Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, you guys got some stuff? I'll pass this class. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'll get with the... <laughs> Today, as... Uh, well, hang on just one more second. As I said, we're at the beginning of a new year and a new unit. And the new unit that we're going to start today is um, Review of the Means of Grace. <clears throat> and then we're going to go into talking about prayer, okay? The doctrine, the teaching on prayer. Using the Lord's Prayer as kind of our outline for that. That's where we are going. I am going to stay with you for the most part, uh, since we don't have officially another pastor. Uh, but I will be uh, having some helpers, too, throughout. Some of those helpers will be what we call our field workers, and they're going to teach units, or lessons, I should say, to you in this unit. Now, this was to review the means of grace. That was what we were scheduled to do here. But we spent a lot of time on that uh, prior to breaking for Christmas. Um, so, I will review that in time as we continue on here. But I thought for fun we'd, uh, we'd do something a, a little different uh, that is something I like to work into the class. So I thought, well, let's just work it in now. I have a little quiz for you to take. Hey, that's yes. fun. <laughs> Pop quiz. Don't worry, it's not a bad quiz. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind, and then I'm going to get my computer set up here while you're taking this. This is, uh, it says answer true or false. There's only 12 of them. And uh, based on your understanding of the Bible, please make this your paper. Now, I probably have enough for everybody to have one. But right now, let's everybody do our own work. And then we'll compare our answers uh, once we're done. So, true or false, it does say any specific Bible reference comes to mind, make note of that. Well, true, if it does, do, but don't worry about that too much. Just a true or false besides each statement. If you want to take one and to the parents, I think there's probably enough for everybody. So if you want to take one and try it too, that'd be great. I'll get this. Okay, I'm just taking care of you. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody get one that wants one? <laughs> Dude, Pretty good. Most of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you spelled your name wrong. <laughs> How do you spell it? Why would you spell it wrong? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> When you're finished, look over your answers. Make sure they are the answers you want. And um, <coughs> here it says, many 
And then if you're sure they're the answers you want, eat, uh, continue eating your dough. There you go. Write it. Would you like a donut, Pastor? No, thank you. Where'd you get them at? Yeah, Haven Bakery. Oh. <laughs> you sure you don't want one? <laughs> yeah, I'd like one, but I'm going to be sitting all day today. Not going to get your steps in? Not going to get my steps in. got to get that sugar going, then. <laughs> <laughs> it only lasts for a short time. I'd have to continually eat donuts. That would Oh, well, we got a bunch of them. <laughs> Who's still working on it? That's fine. you got time. So you want them to give an answer, whether they really are sure or not. You want them to at least... Correct. Okay. Just your best guess. They're not going to kick you out of class. <laughs> I bet there might be some adults here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because you could argue... Right. One way or the other. Most of the answers are probably coming from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Unless you're really versed on the Bible. Mm -hmm. You can educate the wrong thing. Yeah. You should be able to answer oh. this. Think about it. Yeah, no. It's not Adam. Well. So if you want to say true and put Adam and Eve, that way you can like argue your, your point. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just write down yeah. little notes. Okay, start if you're going to have to answer it. Okay. okay. Write what you think. Because you guys are going to talk about it anyway. So. Oh, I always make a good guess. It's prep for testimony. I always make a good guess. I've done a good answer. Okay, hey, is everybody done now? Okay, so right now. <laughs> Which number are you on? <laughs> Two and ten you're having trouble with? Yeah. Okay, just leave it. Just, you know, put a question mark if you don't know. Savannah, I didn't give you that option, but if you want to put a question on <laughs> You have to have me. I'm forcing her. <laughs> you have to have This, uh, yes, this is actually a discussion piece. Now, uh, you all, uh, I have said many times in this class that you all have it tougher than I did, than perhaps your parents did, in terms of being a Christian in our culture today. When I was your age, uh, believe it or not, it uh, wasn't all that long ago, um, 30, 35 years, you no, know, 40, 45 years ago. Wow, that long ago? <laughs> yeah, that long. Boy, that seems strange. At any rate, <laughs> no, that seems like eternity 40, 45 years ago. But I grew up at a time that was changing, no doubt. It was changing times. Uh, and I can give you many examples of that. But I grew up in a time where more or less the culture that I lived in, you know, my neighbors, my teachers, uh, the, the politicians that, that uh, you know, were uh, serving in the community as well as in the United States, we all kind of agreed on morality, okay? And so it was supported. I, I gave you that story when I was in driver's ed, and we went through, uh, I think it was Memorial Park in Muncie, Indiana, and I said to my driver's ed teacher, Mr. Edwards, I said, Mr. Edwards, why are all these men here in their, you know, in the park in the middle of the day in their cars and conversing with one another? It seemed strange to me that I thought they'd be at work or something. Just odd to me. And he said, and here's his exact quote. And remember, I went to a public school. He said, Steve, it's sad, but they're homosexuals. Meaning, of course that he believed that homosexuality was uh, a sin, immoral. And, um, I mean, 
I think I shared that with you, and today he would be severely uh, criticized, if not uh, punished in his position as a teacher to say such words. You can see how things have changed, right? Now, I want to show you a little video here, and then I want to talk about something that's very important for us to understand as Christian people. And let's uh, watch the video, okay? It's, uh, she's got kind of an accent, but don't let that throw you here. I hope we have the volume up. This is Sasha. This is Sam. When they first met, it was just small talk about where to find the best coffee, the new high top she just bought, a book of poetry he found at a used bookstore, a new local band she discovered just last weekend, a zombie apocalypse movie he saw last night with some friends in his martial arts class, her homemade screen print t-shirt, and his favorite Chinese restaurant, which made them both hungry. So they got two orders of Mandarin chicken with brown rice, and then Sam opened his fortune cookie. Life's journey ends with a new beginning. Whoa, that's deep. But in the real world, life's journey ends with an ending. When you die, you're done. Well, yes, your body no longer works, but your soul continues to exist, don't you think? Your soul? No, I don't believe in ghosts. We're physical creatures, material objects, just a collection of highly organized atoms. When your brain flatlines, that's it, game over. So you don't believe in life after death? No. I mean, it's a comforting thought, but there's just no scientific evidence for it. I'd rather face the real world than believe in a fairy tale. Yeah, I agree with you, Sam. It's best to face reality. But it may be that life after death is reality. I mean, think about it. If life just ends at death, then everything we do or say comes to nothing. What meaning or purpose can our lives possibly have? Well, I guess my life has whatever meaning I choose to give it. I personally believe in truth, beauty, science, making the world a better place, saving the environment, freedom of speech, and, you know, tolerance. Yes, that's all well and good. But what does all that matter if it ends in nothingness? What are your thoughts about God? Which God? There are millions of gods. The God that's in the Bible. It's been proven that the Bible is just a bunch of mythology written by ancient desert nomads. But you know, if faith in God makes you feel good, I won't argue with that. But I personally prefer more of a rational, open-minded approach to life. Here's what I believe, Sasha. You shouldn't think anything is true unless it's been scientifically proven. But has that belief itself been scientifically proven? Um... Sam, you and I look at life very differently. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like we're from different worlds. Not different worlds. Different world views. A worldview is the set of lenses through which you see the world around you. It's a web of habit-forming beliefs that helps you make sense of all your experiences. Through your worldview, you interpret life in a particular way. It affects how you think, how you feel, and how you live from day to day. To understand what your worldview is, think carefully about the big questions of life. Does God exist? How did everything begin? Who am I? Why am I here? Am I living a good life? What happens after I die? Cabbages and puppies don't think about this stuff, but people do. Reflecting on these questions is part of what makes us human. In fact, every one of us has a worldview. What's yours? Okay, well that's what we're going to take a look at. What is your worldview? Now, before we do that, do you understand what worldview is? It's how you interpret the world around you. It's that, as he says, that set of lenses that you wear. Now, Christians hold to what is called a biblical worldview. Meaning that we look at the world through the lens, if you will, of what the Bible teaches. Now, as I was saying earlier, when I was your age, most people had a biblical worldview that I encountered. It's not that way today. 
In fact, it may come to the point where the majority of people that you encounter don't have a biblical worldview, which will make it all the more difficult for you to live out your life with a biblical worldview, because you'll be in the minority. And uh, if you know anything about minorities, you know that minorities, uh, well, they have struggles uh, because they're not in the majority. And um, we want to look at your worldview here today with this worldview quiz. And uh, we'll start with number one. Absolute truth exists. Is that true or false? And you know what that means, absolute truth. It means that you have a source of which is truth. It means that if you want to know if something's true or not, you have some place to go to figure that out, if it's true or not. Does it exist? And that would be a yes or no, or a true or false. How many of you put true? Yes, absolute truth does exist. Okay. Those of you who put true, what is your absolute truth? Where do you find? Is it your parents? The internet. Jackson? The Bible. All to hit the internet. <laughs> yes, for Christians, for Christians, the Bible is our absolute truth. And we believe that the Bible is true. That it is without error. It, it comes from God. It is uh, infallible. Uh, and it's authoritative. In order, in the sense that it guides us in all matters and questions of life. Okay? How many of you put false? How many of you dare now say? Because see, here in this room, uh, a non-world—I mean, a non-biblical worldview—you would be more in the minority. But I don't want you to feel like you can't ask a question, you can't struggle with something. Uh, that's that's probably one of the things we've had to deal with, and not real well in the past. Is if you have a question about something. Uh, boy, I know that the Bible might say this, but I'm not sure that's correct. But I'm afraid to say anything about it because people will look at me like I'm an unbeliever. No. We shouldn't have an environment like that. We need an environment in the church in which people can struggle with questions and doubts. Particularly, as they said in this video, those big questions of life. Uh, like, number two, there is only one way to heaven. Is that true or false? Some of you had already indicated to me you're uncertain about that. Okay? Uh, those of you who are uncertain about it, share with us about your uncertainty. What, what caused you to be uncertain about that? Claire, did you? Um, so I was just thinking of like when you're baptized, yeah. That's when you're like welcomed into mm -hmm. heaven. Yeah. But like, what if someone's not baptized but they still believe in God? Oh, that's because a good question. They still are allowed up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the Bible, and we probably should be throwing out some Bible verses here, but the Bible, it talks about uh, baptism. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Okay? But, this is Mark chapter 16. It goes on to say, he that believeth not shall be condemned. It doesn't say he that is not baptized and does not believe shall be condemned. But he that believeth not. Faith is what ultimately saves. Faith in Christ as one Savior. Baptism is a sacrament, another way in which God conveys, you know, we're supposed to talk about means of grace here. Baptism is one of those means of grace. One of the ways God delivers to you the gift of faith in some circumstances. Certainly delivers to you the gift of forgiveness and salvation, but it's not the only way. So it is conceivable one could be saved without being baptized. Yeah. Any, uh, that's a good question. Any other questions about that, those of you who had struggles with that, it's, there is only one way to salvation. I see now how you read that. Yeah, and you read it from a Christian worldview, by the way. 
That's, I, I would say that's good. Um, I think what they intended for this question is, okay, we Christians have our way of being saved, but Muslims who do not believe in Jesus as one Savior, they got their way of being saved. And Buddhists, they have their way of being saved, and other religions have their way. We're, in other words, one of many ways of which we can be, person can be saved. I think that's what they're getting to at this question. And that's, by the way, that's a hard one to avoid in this world today. In fact, <laughs> I have to admit, I, uh, in a public setting, meaning if I'm with a bunch of people who are of different backgrounds and uh, religions and no religions, I don't just jump out there and say, Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Um, because uh, that may cut off dialogue right from the get-go. That is not a very popular notion uh, to broadcast. It's true. The Bible teaches it as being true. Jesus says in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, he says. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, you know, salvation is found and no one else other than Christ, uh, Jesus. So the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is the only way to salvation. In fact, you know, this is the, one of the devil's biggest uh, lies or, or tricks he plays on Christians is to uh, lull us to believe that, well, we're saved through Christ, but other religions are saved in other ways. Uh, the devil likes us to buy into that. And do you know why the devil would like us to buy into that lie? Because what then ceases when we buy into the untruth that there are other ways to be saved other than Christ. What do we what does that end up doing to the church? Why would I have to come? And why would I risk telling anybody about this? Evangelism goes by the wayside. Telling the good news, proclaiming the good news in Christ. Why? I mean, if, if people are saved without Christ, why go to all the trouble and bother? The embarrassment, the potential pain, persecution that could result. Okay, let's look at number three. The Bible is a book of true history. True or false? Maybe I should just call on people. Savannah. But true. True. It's kind of interesting the word history. Because if you break that down at like a compound word, it's what? His story. I do not know if the origins of history actually means God's story. But without a doubt, <clears throat> as you read the Bible, it is a bio, it is, is a book, among other things, it is a book that is written in the context of history. You know, these are all these big names that we sometimes have trouble pronouncing, like Quirinius was governor of Syria, and, you know, it's like, what is all this about? Because this really happened in the context of history. I'm kind of, I uh, haven't done it in a while, but I'm kind of an archaeology buff. And uh, I may have shared this story with you, but who was the governor of Judea when Jesus was crucified? Anybody know? The governor of Judea when Jesus was crucified. You actually say his name quite a bit on Sunday mornings. Pontius Pilate. Did Pontius, you've all heard of Pontius Pilate. Right? The governor uh, who tried Jesus and ultimately gave the conviction uh, uh, to, uh, that Jesus would be crucified. Crucified under Pontius Pilate. Um, did he exist? 
they recently found something that has at least... They did actually recently find a... This was one of the very recent. It was one of the biggest finds in uh, 20... What are we, in 19? It was one of the biggest archaeology finds in 2018. They found a, uh, a ring, a signet ring with his name on it. And that was pretty big. Actually... Several years earlier, an even greater discovery of Pontius Pilate was, dis uh, was found. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because outside of the Bible, there was actually no, what we call a secular or outside of the Bible, uh, reference to a, a person named Pontius Pilate, ever. I mean, you know, one could say, who is this Pontius Pilate? Did he ever exist? That seems a little strange to us because he was the governor of Judea at those certain period of time. I mean, you'd think the Romans would have kept some sort of records. Why didn't we have any record of a Pontius Pilate outside of the Bible? Well, this is what I find this fascinating. I'll try to be quick. The Romans, when you messed up as a politician, they didn't want to keep you in memory of history. The, the communists used to do this too. So they want to obliterate you from history because you were a mess up. And Pontius Pilate did some things that kind of messed up his reign. Okay? Now, so they didn't have any, they, they tried to do away with stuff. Well, one time they were unearthing a, a theater in uh, Caesarea by the sea, by the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, they were putting together the, the theater that kind of had gotten buried over the course of time. And they were putting together the benches of the theater, that kind of thing. And one of the workers flipped it over and saw some writing in Latin on it. And the writing said, in essence, Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea in the years. And all of a sudden, they had something outside of the Bible that confirmed that a Pontius Pilate actually existed. And according to that, you know, find he was the governor of Judea during those certain years of which the Bible says. You gotta understand, they didn't keep records as carefully as we do uh, today. Although, even though we keep records, who's the governor of Indiana? Well, you know that. Did you know that? No. No. <laughs> See, so there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, who was the governor of Indiana in 1978? No. Was it Louis? Mm -hmm. No. Otis Bowen. Otis Bowen, yeah. Who was the governor of Mississippi in 1996? None of us know that, do we? Kirk Fordyce was. But none of us see. So... Even we today don't carry all this big knowledge that we think we carry around. I mean, like someone said earlier, well, we can just Google it. Sure, I mean, the record is there someplace. But you got to understand, they didn't have Google back then. This is really quite fascinating. I could go on with it, but you know, the Bible is one of those rare books of antiquity that actually cites historical happenings. Other religious books, by the way, don't do that. The Quran. You know the interesting thing about the Quran is? There is no reference to anything happening historically. But the Bible happened in history. Now, whether you believe what the historical record says is up to you. But it did happen. To prove, to prove your point even further, we now have a congressional representative who was sworn in on the Constitution because she refused to be sworn in on the Bible. Yeah, yeah, we do. I did see that. Yeah, which is it's more of the culture the, that doesn't have a biblical worldview. Yeah. Number four, abortion is acceptable in many circumstances. True or false? Anybody want to take that one, Alex? Good false. So you would say... Oh, okay. This is in your catechism under the fifth commandment. In fact, if you have your catechism, let's just turn there for a moment. 
One of the big areas in society has been the area of life issues. Okay? And, um, here we go. The fifth commandment starts there on page 85. And the fifth commandment uh, has, has really been one of those that has been uh, bantered about lately uh, regarding a bunch of uh, life issues. Um, look at page 88. Letter B under 61. God gives special dignity or worth and protection to every human life from conception, that is fertilization onward. God created humanity in his own image. God's son became man and shared our humanity, our human nature. God has redeemed every human life and so forth and so on. So uh, look at uh, number 62 at the bottom of the page. How does this commandment apply to some specific issues today? A, it forbids aborting the life of an unborn child, also called elective abortion. Okay? Look at the page 89 there at the top. See the note where it says human life is God's gift. The living but unborn are persons in the sight of God from the moment of fertilization, conception. Therefore, every human life is, pre is precious to Him and is also to be precious to us. Any destruction of embryos through the use of abortifacients, I think that's how you say that word, drugs, or in connection with procedures such as in virtual fertilization is also therefore contrary to God's will. In some rare and exceptional cases, a medical procedure that is actually necessary to save a mother's life may tragically and unintentionally result in the death of her unborn child. Okay? It goes on, now that's the beginning of life. Letter B talks about um, suicide and uh, assisted suicide and killing those persons who are deemed to be too burdensome, which is called euthanasia. But this question here is getting at abortion. And to say abortion is acceptable in many circumstances, well, according to a biblical worldview, would be no. It would be very, very rare, tragic, uh, unintended, but sometimes does happen and sometimes is necessary to save the life of a mother. Now, this question can take us into all kinds of areas. It really can. I mean, we could spend, and we do spend courses on this, but let's take it. Yes? Just a quick thing. Like, that addition to that, the explanation saying in some cases for the save the life of the mother. Is yeah. that a more recent adding note to that? That it's... Why do you ask? Is it your impression because that we would not have done that earlier? Yeah. The there are situ situations yeah. that are life-threatening. Yes. I yeah. mean, I've been in one that yeah. Yeah. the baby had not survived, but yeah. for the safety of me, yeah. you know, I mean, there, there are situations. So that... They see that in a different, it's seen as a different way. Because, unfortunately, one life does have to be sacrificed for the safety of another. Sometimes that does happen, yes. No question about it. The Lutheran Church has never, uh, on this is particular issue, has never changed on that. We have always said, in the case of the life of the mother. Uh, now, we're not saying, uh, well... Let me back up here. We've never changed on that. So no, that is not a new addition. It's new in the sense of these life issues are creating all kinds of questions and they're trying to cover a lot of things in a what's supposed to be a small catechism. But um, the Catholic Church, if I'm not mistaken, would, would actually say that the, uh, the life of the embryo would take precedent over the life of the mother. But the Lutheran Church has not said that. And the best I can understand why we haven't said that is because um, I, would, I would use this example, heroism, uh, being a hero, okay? Um, if I see somebody whose life is being threatened, I do have an obligation to help, okay? But I do not have an obligation to risk my life in order to help. They're in a burning car, okay? 
it's not, I'm not obligated to go into that burning car to save them. Oh, we had one of our own members jump into the St. Joe River. Was it the St. Joe River? It went by IPFW. Uh, he was in this confirmation class not that many years ago. Okay? He saw somebody in the river flailing, you know. He did what he should have done, called 911. Hey, there's somebody in the river who needs help. Please get here as quickly as you can. He did what he should have done in terms of throwing anything he could to help that person latch on to that to stay afloat. He did not have to jump into the river to go in and save her. He chose to do so. He chose to do that. And that's kind of the difference. God does not command that we give up our life for the sake of another. We may choose to do that. And a mother may choose to do that, but she'd have to weigh a lot of options. Personally, I think uh, she would probably be very, uh, not only justified, but very uh, appropriately saying, hey, look, I have other obligations here. So that's kind of how we, we look at it. Do you know what the reasoning behind the Catholic saying the other way is? I don't. It's a good question. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, this this got tons of related questions to it. it sometimes it's called medical ethics. And it's, a, it's actually a field that uh, you might even go into. Christians do need to be in these areas helping to guide society as to how we deal with these advancements in medicine. Okay, when does life begin? When does it end? How are we to treat life in between those times? It's, it's full of questions, but we don't have time for that right now. Let's go to number five. Humans evolved from an ancient, uh, from an ancient ape-like creature. True or false, uh, Hayden? I said false. Okay, and that would be a biblical worldview because we all uh, came from two uh, human beings, a common set of parents, Adam and Eve. Right? That's what the Bible teaches us. I'm going to try to move through these a little quicker. Number six, the God of the Old Testament is harsh. Well, the God of the New Testament is loving. I don't know if this is one that it may have tricked your parents a little bit more than you all because they may know their Bibles a little bit better than you do at this time. But it's always been kind of the view that back in the Old Testament things were, you know, God was harsh with people. People were saved by, I think there's even a question about that. Yeah, the next one. Uh, people in the Old Testament times were saved from their sins by sacrificing animals and doing good works. And both 6 and 7 would be false. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. You know, the only thing about the, uh, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is an unfinished story. The last act has not yet happened. But it's, it's still God's story. The New Testament is the last act. That's why we like the New Testament so much, because ah, it all comes together. Wonderful. Um, but, you know, we sometimes look at that Old Testament and we think, oh, that's a harsh God. No. You even see many instances in the Old Testament that God is, you might say, primarily a God of love, a God of grace. Now, when you study the Old Testament more, as you get out of confirmation and into some other Bible studies, these things might take on some more meaning. Let's look at number eight. The Bible prohibits a dark-skinned person from marrying a light-skinned person. True or false? Anybody want to try that one, Abby? False. False. Yeah. The Bible says nothing about that. Nothing at all. And when the Bible doesn't speak about things like that, well, I mean, specifically, then we go to, well, we all came from a common parent, Adam and Eve, so we're not different, one superior, one inferior in any way, uh, and uh, so uh, interracial uh, dating and marriage is permissible from biblical standards. Sometimes Christians will create 
rules and laws and views that are not biblical. And this might be an example of one. Okay? Now, what does the Bible say about marrying somebody who is not a Christian? There, it gives us a little bit more guidance and warning. Okay? And that you might, as you begin dating, uh, you'll want to take a look at that. Uh, number nine. All death and suffering in the world is the result of Adam's sin. True or false? Let's just shout out the answers. Shout them. Whisper them. Say it. True. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, this is where the whole concept of evolution gets us into trouble, gets people into trouble in that, hey, how do you account for sin when you, you know, take out of the picture Adam and Eve, the sin that is passed on uh, through them, um, and so forth. Uh, number 10. Number 10, science can prove the Bible is true. Jackson? I said true. I'd like you to do it for us then. Please do. Yeah. No, it can't. No, it can't. It can't prove that the Bible is true. Uh, but, Pastor, what yes. about the great debate between Bill Nye and... Ken do you remember Ham. that? Um, Ken Ham. Ken yes. Ham? Yeah. Well, you can have good debates. But at the end of the day, let me just read for you something regarding that. If an outside evidence could prove the Bible were true, that evidence would be great, a greater standard than the Bible itself. That idea is rejected since the Bible is the very Word of God. The Bible must always be the ultimate standard. We might say the evidences confirm or support the truth of the Bible, but they cannot prove the Bible. They confirm and support. Just like the evidence I gave you about Pontius Pilate. You know, that confirms what God's Word says. And I think that debate, Ken Ham was helping to see uh, us to see, that confirms what the Bible teaches. Yes? Another thing is, anything in science can never be proven. You can only disprove a theory. You can never prove it. Oh, so anytime I... somebody comes up with a theory, they do all this evidence to confirm it, but as soon as one person finds evidence that disproves it, then the theory shot. Oh, you can never prove a theory in you. science. Yeah. Good. Um, number 11. Noah, I like this one, Noah took dinosaurs on the ark. What do you think, Austin? Was that one of the ones? No, that wasn't one of the ones. Austin, what do you think? False. False? No dinosaurs on the ark? Did dinosaurs exist? Yeah. We see the bones. Our archaeologists tell us so. Yeah. Let's not be dumb Christians and, 300 million years ago. and go around saying, oh, they never existed. They did. They did. There's not only outside the Bible evidence that they existed, there's actually inside the Bible evidence that they existed. There are creatures that are described in the Old Testament that we don't know what they were describing. We're only guessing what they're describing uh, because we don't have a word correlation, a correlation to that in English. But it would probably be a dinosaur they're describing. It's kind of interesting to see some of those references there in Job and in the Psalms and I think in Isaiah too. Yes? What, uh, what is with the time discrepancy then? Time discrepancy? Yeah, between the... Christian timeline and science timeline. Yeah. The creatures did exist and there are millions over here. Yeah, it's kind of interesting in that whole debate. Evolutionists, if you come from an evolution scientific worldview, as this fella Sam was doing, you know, everything science, you know, if you come from that, you have to have a lot of time to, for the theory of evolution to even remotely be true. So that's why they put things 
so far back because it's going to take a lot of time for things to evolve into this, to this, to this. And they put dinosaurs in that evolutionary chain way back there. But, you know, there's even stories that sometimes uh, dinosaurs uh, in the sea, anyway, potentially still exist there. <laughs> They're just, you know, not always seen uh, by us. Uh, Christians don't need a lot of time. You know, if God created the heavens and the earth, I mean, he didn't even need to take six 24-hour days to do it. He could have done it like that. He's God, after all. But he was creating time as well. We don't need a lot of time. We're not, uh, not going to come out and say, hey, the earth is 8,000 years old. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. But it is probably, most likely, more in the thousands of years old rather than the millions and billions of years old. You can get into other questions like, well, what about carbon dating? Well, carbon dating, which is based on uh, the, the degree of which carbon decays, well, that depends on how you set the clock. Um, hey, I'll just because we're running out of time here. Did I ever tell you this one? Because creation stuff, there's so much talk in that. Um, and I don't know if it's still on Netflix. But uh, Del Tackett, and it, I think it's called Creation, uh, it's a, it was on Netflix. That is an incredibly interesting movie. It will keep your attention. And um, one of the neat things they did is they walked through this area in the United States, and they looked at it, and you know what it looked like? According to evolutionary standards, uh, we're talking about the topography of some land here in the United States. It looked like it happened over the period of, of, of hundreds of thousands of years. And then he kind of surprises us all by saying, well, actually, where we're walking is only 12 years old or whatever. It was the result of the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helen. It once looked like this, but literally in a quick time span, it transformed into looking like this. But if we did not know that Mount St. Helen erupted, we would have concluded this thing is hundreds of thousands of years old, this, this area of land. And it was? Huh? Yes? Um, so like with evolution, it's like where we start out as apes and then we progressively get to humans. Do they have proof of that? Well, not entirely, but they would say the fossil record somewhat. But it's, it's conjecture, it's theory. It's, it's a way of trying to make sense of our origins apart from the Bible. It's interesting. Answers in Genesis gives you a lot of stuff on that too. But I should just finish with this one and then uh, finish with prayer. Number 12, the Bible has guidance for every situation that an individual might face. What do you think, Jackson? True. You know, it is true, technically. But specifically, you know, should I take this job or not? The Bible isn't going to, should I date this girl or not? Should I go this direction or this? The Bible doesn't give it that specific. But the Bible gives us a whole lot more guidance of how we navigate through life than we might realize. Immerse yourself in God's Word. This takes time. It's like anything, growth generally takes time. But as you grow, you will see uh, the results of that growth and how it guides, helps to guide you in making life's decisions and answering life's big questions. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time together today. We recognize, Lord, that there are a lot of big questions in life. But questions, Lord, that You have already addressed for us in Your Word. Keep us, we pray, in Your Word, for as Your Son Jesus said, Your Word is truth. Lord, I pray that You would be with each and every one of our confirmants and their families throughout this week and bring us back safely together here next week as we continue our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll see you all later. Thank you.